This sermon was preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. It's part of our series, 1 Corinthians, Viewing Life Through the Gospel Lens. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged by it. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, has a quote that I think is actually pretty powerful. It's in your sermon notes. If you didn't grab those, they're on the back table. You can grab them. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on thing and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Now, I think there's using some spatial stuff. We know that God's everywhere in that. But I think the idea that he's trying to get at is correct, isn't it? If we're focused in one direction and that direction is on accumulating certain things or thinking that we've accomplished something, or if we compare ourselves to other people, either we look down on them or put us above, uh, we put them above us, then we have problems and there is an issue there. And it takes our focus off of God. And so the Apostle Paul knows the danger of pride and he has seen it in the first Corinthian, in the people of Corinthians and tried to address it in the letter that he wrote to them, which is our book in the Bible called First Corinthians. And so today we are going to look at First Corinthians 4, verses 6 through 21. Now, if you say, well, didn't we look at, read some of this before? You're right. We're going to look at some of it again. Um, again, the Bible was written in a big chunk. The letter was written to be read all together. And we like to look at it in different sections because there's a lot to unpack. And last week's text had a lot to unpack. And so I am combining it with a few verses that we didn't look at before. But just don't go, well, I thought we looked at that last week. There's still more stuff there. Don't worry. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 6 through 21. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For whoever makes you different from any, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich You've begun to reign, and without us, how I wish that you really had begun to reign, so that you might reign with, we might reign also reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. And we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored and we are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated and we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When, you are, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. And we become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. And he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you, and very soon, if the Lord is willing... And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not about a power of talk, but a power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? Now, I know that I say this quite a bit, but I think it's very important for us, especially, you know, sometimes people, this is their first Sunday here, to make sure that we understand the context of 1 Corinthians. Paul says some pretty blunt things. And he says some things that when you don't have the right context could come off in a different way. It's important for us to know that Paul cares for the Corinthians. He deeply cares for them. As I said earlier, he, he actually was with them for a longer period of time than he spent with most of the churches he planted. He, he was there for a year and a half. He knew the people. He cared about them. And it hurt him to hear the reports that things were going differently than he had hoped when after he had left and so he views them as his spiritual children. 
And so he's writing to them as a father who cares for them. And that's important for us to know. That's the tone. And it's not a harsh father, like some of us may have had to endure, not an angry father, but rather a father who cares deeply for his children and wants what's best for them. He says, actually, in a comparison, he says, I'm not like that slave, which the NIV translates as the guardians, who were tasked with raising kids, and they were known for being harsh. They just wanted to get them from point B to point A, or from point A to point B, or to do what they wanted them to do. Their context of how kids were raised was very different than ours, and so they would have a servant whose job was to take over things, and those servants were often very harsh with their kids. He's like, I'm not like them. And you may have all kinds of people who are temporarily taking over. No, I'm your spiritual father, and I'm writing to you because I care about you deeply, and I want you to hear this. And he wants them to learn not only from himself, but Timothy's example. And so he's sending them, somebody who he trusts, to come back to the church and to help kind of guide and direct them. And so he sends them Timothy. Timothy is the guy who Paul writes, uh, and two letters are in the Bible. And the cool thing is, I I want you to hear, is that actually, if you read 2 Corinthians, Paul's pretty harsh in 1 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians, we see that some of the things that they're struggling with, that God actually moved in their hearts and they changed. And so I want you to see that even though he speaks bluntly, and he's going to point out different pride in attitudes, and, and today it is pride in their heart, that he has the heart of a father who cares for his kids, and he, he wants what's best for them. And he's, he's not just saying, hey, get, take care of it on your own. He's actually sending people there to help them. That's what we see in this letter. He says, I'm going to send you, Timothy, to help you. And so it's important for us to know that context. But Paul does speak very bluntly about the prideful attitude that he's seeing in the Corinthians. I mean, it doesn't get any much blunter than some of you become arrogant. No one likes to think they're arrogant. If there's ever something that is so tough for us to see in ourselves, it's probably pride and arrogance. We can see it in other people. It can rub us wrong in other people. But it's one of those things that we don't often see in ourselves. And I also think that we have to be careful because sometimes pride presents itself in different ways. Often when we think of pride, we think of people who are or basically, you know, they think that they're on top, they're the know-it-alls, and they look down on everyone else, and, and that is pride. But there's also an element of pride where when we base our value and our worth off of where we think we are in the totem pole, the people who are like the boasting who look down on others, that's one way it presents itself. But another way that it can present itself is just when we think we don't measure up. And, and it's counterintuitive, but But really what it is, is that it's we're basing our value and our worth on something else. And that really is what pride is. Pride is valuing ourselves that we're better than other people or that we have certain things that we need to be boastful of. But if we still are in working in this kind of boasting and prideful narrative, it may not always feel like we're on top. Sometimes it may feel that we're on the bottom, but we're still playing the same game. Do you get what I'm saying? It's this game of saying, I base my life and my value and my worth on whatever it is that I think is important. And when I feel like I'm on top, then I can look down on everybody else. But when I feel like I'm on the bottom, then I look up and I feel like I don't have value and worth. And what Paul's going to challenge them to do is to get off that game, to get off that track, because it's dangerous and it goes in a wrong, different direction, But he uses three different images that he wants to highlight how it is when people are on the pride train that's leading towards destruction. The first image that he uses is being puffed up. He says it here in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, now brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to my benefit. But he says, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one verse against the other. If you remember, the whole point we've been talking about for three chapters is People are saying, look, I'm better than you because I follow Paul or I follow Apollos, different teachers in the church. And what he says is, you're like a puffer fish. You've allowed this to go to your head and it just gets bigging bigger and bigger and bigger. And he says, that's a dangerous thing. And I think this is the one that it's really hard for us to see in ourselves sometimes 
because it's slow. It happens over time. And, and we kind of puff ourselves up and, and we make ourselves bigger to everybody else and they can see that you're a puffer fish who's gone this big. But you think that you're still kind of in this narrow spot. But Paul says that when we're prideful, that kind of an attitude of puffing ourselves up, throwing out our chest is what it is. And one commentator uses the image of this as a, a, a rooster who like struts his stuff. I don't have any roosters, thankfully, but I can see that that would be the case, right? It's being puffed up and thinking that we're better than everybody else. The other image that he uses is that of being stuffed to the gill. He says, pride can come in that they think that they have everything they needed. It's an image that somebody created, I forget the name, of gluttony. But really the image that he uses is that you already have all you want You've already become rich. Now that image of you already have uh, what you want is like what we feel like after Thanksgiving dinner. At least I do because I overeat. It's just so good. You know that feeling where you're just so bloated that you kind of have to let the belt out about two or three notches. And it's this feeling of contentment. And, And what do you, in overextension. And what Paul says is that in life, the, what the Corinthians have is they've been so about accumulating these things and being prideful about it is that they're just bloated and they don't even realize it. They think that they have everything they need. And so he uses this sarcasm with them about you think that you've already begun to reign. And really what he's highlighting there is not that they are reigning because in some senses we are reigning with Christ. And I think that's what he's saying about when, when Christ comes again, We'll, we'll understand what life is really meant to be. That's what he means with reigning with each other. But in this text, he's saying, you think that you're above everybody else and that you could just look down on them. And this combination of being puffed up and stuffed and bloated gives them that feeling of superiority of others where they look down on them. It's, it's important for us to see that. I mean, it's important for us to see that when we, we kind of think that we have everything we need and, and sometimes we, we're just all about that and just bringing whatever it is or where we're puffed up and we look down on others, that natural feeling of superiority is going to seep into our lives. What Paul says is when that attitude seeps into our lives, it's a very, very dangerous thing because what it does is it destroys relationships. I want to ask you this question. What areas do you sometimes feel superiority to others? What are those areas where you kind of judge yourself and you say, well, they're here and I'm here? Or, yeah, you know, I mean, maybe you say more blunter things, like they don't know what they're talking about, whatever it is. But what are those areas that that make you feel better about yourself and you belittle others? My guess is, is that that is an area where we struggle with pride. And and here's the thing, we all struggle with pride, okay? We need to be careful about it. You know, it's interesting. There's a couple of websites that I, I like to watch or read, and it's like all the bad stuff that happens in church. Now, part of it just breaks my heart. And I, I hate, I see it so I know what's going on, so that people bring it as ammo against me. You know, I can say, yeah, that happened, and it's terrible. But you know what? There's also a part of me that I think I go to it, and I'm drawn to it because it's like, well, at least I'm better than them. What is that in my own heart? That's pride. There's a little bit of arrogance. Now, I hope I'm better than them. I hope that I display the Christ-likeness and that that is what we see. But do you see where there's just a little bit of rush sometimes that we get, that little dopamine or whatever it is? It's just we want to feel better than others. And, and even in sometimes good things, we can allow it to be twisted, and we need to be careful. I love this quote from a guy named Jerry Bridges, and he wrote this book called Respectable Sins, we, we, Confronting the Sins That We Tolerate, and pride is one of them. He says, he speaks in here and he says, the pride of the Pharisees that Jesus spoke against is moral self-righteousness. But this is what he says. 
Moral self-righteousness expresses itself in the feeling of moral superiority with respect to other people. This type of pride is not limited to believers. It's found in the political and cultural realms among both liberals and conservatives. Anyone who believes, for an example, that he holds the moral high ground in any area such as politics or economics or environmental policy is likely indulging in moral self-righteousness. I read that and I thought, I don't like it. But I think he's right. It is so easy for us to play this comparison game and to belittle other people and their opinions and get a little bit of self-righteousness from it. And we live in a culture that just propagates this. You know, we can listen to news channels that say, aren't we glad that we're not like those bad guys on the other side of the aisle? Or aren't we glad that we're not either side and we're in the middle? Or aren't we glad that we, I mean, you pick it, that the issue, that we, you know, we drive gasoline cars and those guys drive hybrids. Or oh, we look, we drive hybrids and we're better than everybody who drives gasoline cars. I mean, I don't care what you drive. What I care about is your attitude towards the others who drive it. But it's so easy for us to kind of play that comparison game, isn't it? I mean, even it can happen in church and we can have an attitude of like, well, we believe this doctrine and trust me, doctrine is important. There's reasons why I believe what I do and I will have a great argument with anybody about them. But even in pushing on there, I can have a a feeling of of superiority because I think I know the Bible better than they do. That's the issue where we got an issue. Does that make sense? Like, let's have a rigorous debate. Let's talk about why we believe something and have our Bibles open and debate it. But the minute that I feel like I'm better than them because they view something different than me, well, then we have an issue. Now, we need to be careful here because what we're not talking about is tolerance where we just accept anything. We can still call something a sin, and Paul's, trust me, we got lots of 1 Corinthians left where he's going to do that. But it's more of the hard attitude that he's trying to hit at in us where we feel like we are better than other people, and we feed off of that. And what he's asking us to do, what he's trying to get us to do is to look at our own lives and ask ourselves, what are those moments where we feed off of it thinking we're better than other people or where we feel like we don't measure up because then it feels bad. That's the bad side of pride. And he says, look at those times when that is what you're basing your life off of. And, and be careful because that train is heading towards destruction. Here's why. Because you and I will never measure up to what we think we have. You can accumulate all these things and it won't be enough. Or you can think that you finally get somebody's respect and and then somebody will disrespect you and that feels completely bad. And and then it's a never-ending cycle. And and what Paul is saying is what C.S. Lewis says is when you have your focus on these things and accumulating things and, and being bloated, or when you think that you're better than other people and you allow that attitude to sink into our hearts, it's destructive. Because what you have is your eyes on all these other things and you focus on the thing that really matters, which is our relationship with Christ. And if we can have our relationship with Christ right, then guess what? If somebody disrespects us or somebody says something bad about us, or if we don't feel like we're measuring up we can feel secure in that because we're grounded because that relationship is right and those things are right. That's why he he points it out. And so this week, I want to encourage you just to think about it. What are those subtle ways, or maybe not so subtle, that pride has come into our own hearts? Again, it's not naming things right or wrong or it's not having conversations about doctrine or those kind of things and wrestling with those. What he's highlighting is that feeling of superiority where we put ourselves up here and we look down on others that he's trying to address. Does that make sense? He also gives us, though, some antidotes to pride. 
One of the antidotes is just people. People in our lives that care enough to point out our pride to us. Let's be honest, it's not always fun. Nobody likes to hear I'm prideful or I'm being arrogant or I'm being a jerk. But sometimes we need people in our lives to help be that mirror for us. And Paul is being that mirror to the Corinthians and he's sending Timothy to be that person. And and what he is, is he's just being blunt to them. He's like, hey, what we're going to see is not if you just talk, but where are you at in your actions? That's what I want to see. That's how he ends the text. But there's certain kind of people who have the power to speak into our lives, and Paul talks about this. The first one thing is that they are humble. They're humble. If there's anything about the Apostles Paul, we could read this list and where he rattles off all these things that he's doing and the other people aren't, and you could think, man, he's cocky. He's a little arrogant himself. Maybe he needs to listen to his own message. But that's not the attitude that Paul's having. What Paul's trying to say is, look, the things that you guys care about, I don't care about. I'm basing my life on something different. And the reason is because my relationship with Christ is settled. And if you look at how he writes to Timothy, the person that he sends to the Corinthians to help deal with this matter, how does he describe himself? He says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Now I want you to see, he's not saying who I was the worst. He was a persecutor. He did persecute Christians and he did do that. He says, I'm still the worst. That doesn't seem like a person who's prideful. That seems like a person who actually is pretty self-aware and isn't willing to hide from his own sin, but rather feel the weight of it. But he also reminds himself of grace in that moment. And so Paul is humble. But they also interact in a gentle way. I love how he ends this text. He says, should I come with a rod of discipline or should I come in love and with a gentle spirit? And that's a rhetorical question. Usually you don't win a battle with people who are prideful, being prideful and coming at them hard themselves. The way that you win the heart of those who are prideful is to show them humility and gentleness. Paul's firm in this letter. He pulls no punches. He, He calls things what they are. He says, you're being arrogant. But his life is is living in such a way that they understand that he is that father that cares for them. He's gentle. And he is humble. But he also reminds them of three different truths. He reminds them of three different truths. It's the questions that we looked at briefly last week. For who makes you different from anyone else? And what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? The truth that he wants us to see is that we are all sinners in need of God's grace. He says that. Who, who makes you different than anyone else? Romans, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Here's the difference. When we play the pride game, what we are doing is we are measuring ourselves, and we always want to be the tallest one. I got kids who are going through growth spurts. Like, I, I look at a measuring stick on our wall, and it's like, here's where they were a year ago, and now they're like, boing! And when we play the pride game, that's what we want to do, right? We want to say, look at me, I'm here, and everybody else is below. And what Paul says is, in, in the section right before that we looked at last week, I don't want to play the, 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 the measuring game. Because here's the thing, if we want to play the right measuring game, it isn't what you think or even what I think of myself. The right measuring game is what God thinks of me. And here's the thing, I already know that I'm a failure. He says it here, he says, my conscience can even be clear and that doesn't make me innocent in in the eyes of the Lord who judges me because God knows the things that are going inside of my heart that I may not even be able to see in myself. And just because I don't even see him doesn't mean that I am not being judged by that. But the good news is, is that what he also says is that here's the deal. That when Jesus comes again, 
If we have faith in him, if we truly believe what Romans says, that all have sinned by grace, but we are also freely saved by the work of Christ Jesus, if we believe that text, then what it meant is that God doesn't judge us by our own actions, but rather by the actions of Christ. And when we understand that, we get off this comparison game because we realize that we are all equal. We're all equal sinners. Yes, some have done bigger things that have had more repercussions in people's lives or their own lives, but every sin is equal. And if we think that we're better than someone else, then really what we're doing is not being honest about ourselves in the eyes of God. And what Paul says is if you want to get off the pride train, it starts with us remembering that we are all on level ground. What makes you different from anyone else? The answer is nothing. We're all sinners in needs of God's grace. And that is the thing that we need to drill in ourselves if we want to get off the pride train. We all have failed in the measuring stick of God, but by God's grace, Christ has broken that measuring stick, or at least God is judging us by his actions and his perfection, not ours. The other thing that he highlights is that everything we have is a gift from God. He says, and I hit this last week, but it's so important, What do you have that you did not receive? That's a rhetorical question. And the answer is nothing. Think about this. I did not choose the family that I was born into. I did not choose the time in which I was born. I did not choose the talents and the gifts that God has hardwired me for that make me different than each and every one of you. I can go on and on on the list But if you really boil down into it, you and I have very little input. Yes, we put work into it. I'm not saying that. Yes, sometimes we can make unwise decisions. But but here is the deal. Everything we have is a gift. And the more that we realize that it is not about us and it's more about God, then that frees us to not be prideful because guess what? You may have gotten all straight A's, but who gave you the brain to be able to get all straight A's? On the flip side, you might have gotten all D's, but guess what? God gave you that brain. And if you're actively at work in that, and that's the best that you can do, then great. Now my kids are going to say, see, Dad, God wired me with D's. I tell them all the time, I don't care about the grade. I care about the work. But you may not be great in this talent that you think you should be. And you may be better at something else. But guess what? It's okay because that is how God wired you and everything is a gift. And so the more that we realize and have that perspective of that everything we have is a gift, it will not make us arrogant because guess what? That person's better than you at whatever it is because that's the way God wired them and God wired you here. And so you don't have to play the comparison game. Why? Because God wired you both that way and both gave you different gifts. And so it's not about one being better than the other. It's more about God made you this way and God made me this way. Does that make sense? And the more that we have that perspective, then we don't play comparison like I'm better or worse, but rather this is the gift that God has given me and I'm going to use it and this is the gift that God has given them. Maybe it's more finances. Maybe it's less finances. Maybe it's more patience. I don't know. You choose it. Doesn't mean that we don't continually work to grow and get rid of our sins. That, that's not what I'm saying. But, the tr- but really what it is, is realizing that everything we have is a gift from God and we need to remember that. And then the last thing I think is, is this, that our primary identity has to be part of God's fam- Christ family. And I'm gonna say this in our culture today because I think it's important. I don't think that cultures are, there's, I think this is always an issue in culture, but I think as we, in our current mindset, it's just been raised, and that is this. Our politics, our way that we think about certain things should not be our primary identity. Our primary identity as Christians is that we are in Christ's family. And so 
we are children of God who are involved in politics. I have no problems with being involved in politics. Vote, please vote. Go be involved in those different things. But there's a difference by putting our hope and trust in a political party or in a candidate and making that our ultimate thing than Christ. Does that make sense? So I'm not a Republican who's Christian or a Democrat who's Christian or a third party who's Christian. I am a Christian who is invested in politics. Does that make sense? I'm not a Christian, I'm not a pastor or I'm not an engineer or I'm not a teacher. I am a Christian who God has called to that role. The more that we have that mindset, the less arrogant we'll be. Because what is our primary identity? Our primary identity is Christ and God's gift to us in all these different things. Now, the way that Paul highlights it in this text is we are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. Now, he's being sarcastic here, and he's going to unpack that in later in this text. But I want you to see that phrase, in Christ, that's repeated throughout this. Because what he wants them to understand is that your primary identity is what Christ has done for you, not what you do for God or your comparison with other people. If we get caught up in what we do or if we get caught up in all of these other things, we are taking our focus on looking down instead of looking upward. And so Paul wants to encourage us to remember, to remember, we are all even, we are all sinners who need God's grace. Everything we have been given, including our faith, is a gift from God. I mean, the Spirit was at work in all of our lives more than we even realize. Opening our eyes to his faith and his truth. And we don't usually recognize it until we're way further down the road. And everything we have, our gifts, our talents, anything that we can think that we can brag about, all of it is a gift of God. And so we need to realize that. That's how we fight pride in our own hearts. Not by saying, okay, I'm gonna really work on being humble and just not talk about myself. good start but really what it, he says is instead it's man this is what God has done God knew that I didn't measure up and he still gave me Christ's grace he gave me more than I can even imagine and, and even though it doesn't feel like it's enough sometimes and I may wrestle with that He still provided me with a lot of stuff and a lot of things and people in my life. And though the world may try and separate us and say, you you need to be this and you need to feel better about being this versus the other, I'm not gonna let those things divide me. Rather, what I'm gonna focus on is my primary identity, which is I am part of God's family. And I'm going to let that be the thing that matters most in my life. That's how we fight pride. That's how we pray pride. Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it. And we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.